hey, AP government people and everyone else in the world who randomly watches this, there could be, right? Here we are to the long awaited ratification of the Constitution. So I'm outside in the parking lot today since I can't find a quiet place in the STEM building. So you might hear things like airplanes. Who knows what could happen? Um, but this is um, one of my favorite things to share with you guys about um, the ratification of the Constitution, which took place in Philadelphia. Um, I will tell you how excited I am about it. I took a graduate course that was just on the ratification of the Constitution. I took another one just on the state ratifications. I've gone to day seminars, weekend seminars. I really love learning about this. So um, I feel like it's hard to condense it to what the AP people think you should know about this. So throughout the year, I'll be sharing more stuff related to this. And if you have questions about it, um, please, please um, don't hesitate to ask. If I don't know it, um, I'll be curious to try to find out. So when we look at the delegates in Philadelphia, they had a lot of things um, on their mind to consider. And one of the th big things was about protection and basically about how to protect rights. It is not truthful to say that the main concern of the delegates was all like, how do we secure everyone's individual rights? Um, it was a concern. But their main concern was just to create a functional government, all right? We sort of emphasize a little bit too much about the emphasis on individual rights in the Constitution at the beginning. Um, but anyway, they had two basic ways to try to do this. And one was to provide structural barriers in the Constitution and the structure of the government, basically checks and balances. If you can protect... Um, any branch from being tyrannical or any group from being tyrannical, you'll therefore protect the rights of the people. The other way was just to have a Bill of Rights. Keep in mind, many states already had their own Bill of Rights. They were different state by state, similar. Um, but what if you had a, a federal Bill of Rights? Of course, the decision was basically eventually to have both. The Bill of Rights was not initially in the Constitution, but it was sort of promised at the end that it soon would be. Another big issue is representation. If we're going to be a democracy where the people are represented, how do you best do that? Um, keep in mind, you also still need checks against the people, against majorities or various things. So representation was decided that the House would have direct elections. So people, when you vote, you vote for your House, your congressman or woman. That would be the most direct form of democracy. Now, the state would be to protect state interests. Okay, remember, I'm sorry, the Senate. Remember, it's not just we the people. It's we the people of the United States. And that's really important to remember. So at this point, the state's legislature would actually um, elect the senators. Now, we know there's been an amendment to change that. But this was how you both had the interest and individual rights represented and protected. Would this be enough, however, to protect tyranny? Of course, we know that there would be checks and balances that would protect it, but would it still be enough? And that was really the biggest discussion they would have there at the, con at the Constitutional Convention. So in history class, um, you probably learned about the New Jersey Compromise, the Virginia Compromise. And what happens as a result is, it's not really, the, I should say, the Virginia Plan and the New Jersey Plan. And as a result, you get the Connecticut Compromise, also known as the Great Compromise. And you see Roger Sherman here, um, a big force behind that. And that's because large states wanted representation based on population. If they had more people, they'll get more of their interests um, looked after. Of course, if you have a small state, you're Delaware, you New Jersey, you would want equal, right? You don't want the voice of a small state to be drowned out by uh, Virginia or Pennsylvania, New York or Massachusetts. So the Great Compromise um, in instead is sort of combines both ideas. You get a bicameral legislature. That means two houses. So you get, just like in England's parliament, there's the House of Lords and House of Commons. Here you have a Senate and a House of Representatives. So the House would be where the people directly elected them. The idea was that these were not lifelong politicians. They would have their jobs back home. They would really represent the people. They have short terms of only two years. They would constantly be trying to get for re-election. 
And also, this is where the origination of many things concerning money would go come from, especially taxation. So if the people did not like the way they were being taxed, right, just like they didn't um, uh, when they were colonies, they could vote out these people quickly. The Senate, who would have other powers, advise and consent, really have a lot more checks on the executive branch, deal with appointments to um, things like the Supreme Court and other positions. They would have, so you would actually have checks within the branch itself. A lot of the founding fathers thought that the legislative branch was the biggest risk to tyranny. Definitely not the Supreme Court, not the executive, but they really thought that the legislative branch would be where it could come from the easiest. So they had checks built with even in that branch with the two, um, the bicameral situation. Keep in mind, the article in the Constitution about the legislative branch is the longest one because there's just so much in there about that. So this would, like I said, provide some structural checks and, and really try to prevent tyranny arising from Congress. Then you have the Electoral College. We're going to get into this more because a lot of people have questions about this. But this deals with representation and the executive branch. They did think that a single executive was necessary, not several. There's Federalist Papers written by Hamilton um, that expresses this that we'll be learning about. It also was to provide some restraint and some checks against the people on elections. The electors, their numbers would come from Congress's numbers. So if you had a large number of representatives in Congress, you would then have a um, proportionate number of electors. Now, because it is federal, each state has their own method of appointing electors. You know, we saw that video of some of the different means it takes to become an elector from C-SPAN. So the electors vote, they send votes to Congress. If there's a tie, which has happened, um, the House will break the tie, and then the Senate would actually break the tie for the vice president. Um, and there was something, this is just from the news last week, mid-September, um, about because of sort of the chaos that came about on January 6th, uh, 20, uh, you know, two years, two years ago there, um, they're going to try to pass a bill to make it more so that they can't try to find a way to bend the rules. So I'll share that article with you guys. Now, an important part of the Constitution when it comes to compromises as well is the three-fourth compromise. And the three-fifths, I'm sorry, the three-fifths compromise was about representation and direct taxes when it came to the number of slaves in the United States. Now, there were slaves in the North, but we all know that the vast majority of slaves were from the South. The term slave is not found in the Constitution. And there's the big debate, is the Constitution a slaveholder's document or a freedom document? And, and we can talk about that. Um, what I disagreed with, with the AP presentation of this part of the unit, was they said that it was never a moral issue at the Constitutional Convention. We know that's not true. We know they did discuss the morality of slavery at the Constitutional Convention. How do we know? Well, James Madison took copious notes, and you can find them, right? Um, Gordon Lloyd, one of the professors I took with, did... Uh, great work. And, and, and there's websites where day by day they mark the notes, what they discussed that day. So instead of me putting it all here, um, I'm actually going to create um, an appendix to this video that shows the many examples where the morality of slavery was discussed, even by slaveholders, right? Even people like James Madison, James Madison, who was a slaveholder and considered moving to New York at one point so that he could get away from slave, econ and slave economy because he knew it conflicted with his morals. He knew it conflicted with the values of the revolution. So to act like it was just based on population representation, it was just based on taxes, that they had no discussion of morality would be wrong. The language, however, in the Constitution does deal with representation, okay? What the North was afraid of is that this would overrepresent the interest of the South because the slaves would not have the power to vote, yet three-fifths of them were being used to get more representatives, right? And to collect more taxes and, uh, you know, more, more funds from it. Of course, they could be taxed, but either way, it would work to their advantage. The South was willing to walk out over this. If you guys don't um, agree to this, 
basically to some form of representation like this, we're going to walk away. And of course, we would have then floundered on the Articles of Confederation. There was um, a common idea that slavery was sort of on its way out. Of course, technological advances made that unfortunately not the case. Uh, they did consider, okay, well, maybe we can just stop when slavery, like we could put a date, like this is when the sales of slaves has to stay, stop. This is when the importation of slaves has to stop. That sort of became the discussion then instead. All right. So there's a lot of discussions about this. I am going to, like I said, I'm going to put a little addendum to this. Um, know it's unfortunate and know that it is more complex than it may seem at first. Um, but they knew right from the beginning that this was going to be an issue, um, a big source of tension and conflict over the young nation. So what another big part is allowing the version for constitutional amendments. Some people thought the Constitution should be revised every few years. Now, one of them was Jefferson. Uh, it's probably good he was actually in France at the time and had no real part besides exchanging some letters with Madison at the Constitutional Convention. But most knew that we needed stability and that it had to stay in place. But how could we amend it? It's a very federal process, which means both the states and the federal government would be included in parts of it. So in order for an amendment to pass, two thirds of each House of Congress had to pass an amendment. Three quarters of all states had to pass it. Now we know that's not an easy task to get all these states on board and all these Congress people are, um, on board as well. But we know how it was under the Articles of Confederation when it was close to impossible, right? So this does help as well. And a lot of the amendments deals with individual rights, expanding freedoms. So the we of the people part of the Constitution is really more in the additions to the Constitution, not the original part of it. Then ratification debates ensued. It's really important to know, and I'll talk more about this, like I said, because I, I love learning just about the differences between the ratification in Virginia to Massachusetts to New York, right? It's they all sort of had different issues and points of contention. Um, and it didn't happen overnight. Just because the Constitution was written and most of the delegates agreed to it, it still was a long time, right? Months, years before it became official because you needed a certain amount of number of states to ratify it. And each state had a conversation about what do we like, what do we don't like. And this is where the Federalist Papers come out and all sorts of writings. Some rogue island we call them didn't even have a convention you see them not a part of a lot of the stuff in the beginning north carolina one of the biggest states really did see it as a threat and said no right many other states took a lot more convincing the only big state that didn't really take convincing was pennsylvania i know i discussed in one class how they wanted to be the first to ratify the constitution this is where it was written but delaware delaware beat them but they tried so hard they were literally dragging delegates out of bed at night being like, you need to come vote, basically terrorizing the delegates to try to vote yes. So they, they were next to ratify it. But state by state, they, were, they suggested many amendments. If you include all the states, over 200. Some even proposed, uh, just let's get these ideas together and then have another constitutional convention. Madison and others were like, no, no, no. If that happens, it's never like it's never going to come about. We just need to get this passed, and then we'll amend as necessary. So what was needed? Lots of compromise. And the biggest one was that, hey, we promise once this gets signed in and this government starts, the first thing Congress is going to do is pass this Bill of Rights. Madison, who didn't even originally want a Bill of Rights, knew how important it was, so agreed to this compromise and made sure once he was in Congress that it was one of the first things to get passed. Now, it really wasn't the first thing. They first had to agree to things like, what are we going to call the president? Is it his royal excellency? No, royal is not the right word. Well, what do we call him? Words like things like that. But very soon, the Bill of Rights was discussed and passed. Um, and I'd like you to see here, this is just the order. I mentioned Delaware was first. I mentioned that Pennsylvania was closely thereafter. Jersey, we were third, right? But look how long it took, right? North Carolina eventually changed its, its mind about it. Rogue Island officially is like, I guess we got to sign on to this too. But before you even get to the nine states, look at that, right? It, it, it's a long process before it becomes official and this government gets started. So I love to talk about this more. 
Um, I hope you enjoyed a little bit about it. And let's soon talk about more about slavery, the Constitutional Convention. It's bright out here, so I can't really see my mouse. There we go.